have you ever been on a driving range and you had got to a point for your skill level where you couldn't hit it any better and you have a moment where you, whether you say it to yourself or one of your friends who you're practicing with that you've got it you figured it out and this is going to be the best ball striking day of your life but then you go on the course and you hit it worse than you ever have before you can't you don't know which direction it's going and it's just one of the worst days you could possibly have had it's a major letdown well if you answered yes don't feel bad because you're not alone we've all been there happens to golfers at all skill levels but the solution is not to practice more it's to practice better and that's exactly exactly what my guest today is here to discuss his name is Dr. Will Wu, and he is a professor of motor learning at Cal State Long Beach. Now, Dr. Will is not a swing coach, but he helps take what you and your coach are working on and allows you to learn it exponentially better. Now, I'm not going to even attempt to, to uh, try and describe what Dr. Will does um, any more than that, and he does a great job of saying that very early on in today's show. But he is helping students at all levels uh, – improve more readily and faster than they even thought they could. Uh, this was an awesome talk, and we barely even scratched the surface on what mo on the motor learning field, and I'm definitely going to have Doc Will on again so we can continue to bring you this awesome information and to as many people as possible so you can start reaching the levels that you always knew you could. So please give it up for one of the best motor learning co coaches in the game, Dr. Will Wu. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Golf 360 Podcast. I'm the host, Pete Popovich. So you may be asking yourself, what is Golf 360? And Golf 360 is a show that was designed to introduce you to people associated with the game of golf to help you improve not only at your game, but also your life. Almost all of our guests are from within the industry in some way, shape, or form, but some of the guests we have are from outside the industry, and it mainly revolves around the business world with a few others scattered in here and there. Now, all of the guests that we have have a few things in common. One, they all were highly successful and accomplished in their field. Two, each has something to pass along that will help you in your game and your life. And three, they were all more than willing to give back by passing along the things that they used to help them in their career and even some of the mistakes that they made so that others don't make them in their journey. So I hope you find listening to them as enjoyable as I did interviewing them, and that each and every one of you benefits from the information that they so willingly and graciously pass along. This episode of the Golf 360 podcast is brought to you by Affinity Wealth Management Group. We all work exceptionally hard for our money, and none of us can afford to let that fall into the dark abyss of the big box financial service firms with their jack-of-all-trades and master-of-none mantra which basically means you become a number within a cookie cutter model, which is often accompanied by massive fees. Your future deserves more than average returns, and at Affinity Wealth Management, they ensure that your financial goals receive highly indiv individualized, tailored attention from experts who are in the industry to be great and not average. As a client of Affinity Wealth, you will receive a customized solution to your customized life. Keeping in mind your family's financial situation, values, and risk tolerance. Contact them today at 248-840-3863 or www.affinitywealthmg.com. This podcast is brought to you in part by Just Thrive Probiotic. You may be surprised to learn that your digestive system is the key to creating and maintaining the quality of your physical, mental, and emotional health and it's one of the body's most essential systems. That's why the majority of nutritionists today highly recommend probiotics as an indispensable nutritional supplement. As a discriminating consumer, you've probably been searching for a probiotic that is proven, potent, and effective, and you found it. Just Thrive is your best choice for maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Just Thrive Probiotic captures the power of hundreds of thousands of years of nature's design with a specialized bacillus strain formulation that guarantees survivability through the stomach and upper digestive system. Supports optimum gut health, digestive health, immune health, and delivers antioxidants. Great for adults, kids, and the whole family. Use promo code GOLF360 at www.thriveprobiotic.com for 10% off your order. Okay, I'm here with the super, super smart 
Dr. Will Wu. Doctor, doctor, thank you for coming on the show. It's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, my pleasure. That's uh, Thank you for that. For people out there that might not know what motor learning is uh, and have tuned in, can, can you just give a, a description of that so, so someone who, who hasn't followed you or know who you are can, can kind of follow along if they're golf fanatics like most of my listeners are? Yeah, I'm glad that you asked that question because it's a really um, undercover or maybe not pub- publicized um, scientific discipline in the in the sports sciences or the movement sciences. Um, I mean, simply stated, it's just basically the science of how we produce and control movements and how we learn new movements and how we refine existing ones. And so a lot of my students at the university level, um, they're aspiring physical therapists and occupational therapists. Mm-hmm. So there's a prehab rehab component, maybe more of a rehab component to the science. Um, but there's also a major sports athletics component to it. And as you can imagine with golf, um, highly skill related activities, um, understanding how people control their movements and how they practice or, or learn them is, is critical or it's highly important. So, um, I think it gets a lot of, it gets a lot more traction in golf than some of the other major sports is in my kind of macro big picture perspective golf seems a little bit more or there's a segment of the golf coaches and golf population that's a little bit more science driven in terms of their application into the sport Mm -hmm. and so when you're like that you're looking for all the different ways that you can help golf performance and so um you know a lot more golf coaches are asking about motor control and learning questions uh, than there are you know football coaches basketball coaches or baseball coaches and so um, a lot of traction in, in golf because, you know, the community seeks it. How, how would what you do, how would that differ from, let's say, the learning intelligence model of somebody like the world-renowned uh, Dr. Howard Gardner? Uh, from, with the, with the, the, was it uh, eight, eight level or eight different learning styles? Yeah. I'm glad that you bring up learning styles. I'll kind of address that in a little bit. I think one of the distinctions that you have to make um, – with what I do, I do what's called motor control and motor learning. And the key important part there is motor. It's how we're, how we're moving. There's a whole segment of learning, let's say within psychology, cognitive Mm -hmm. psychology that deals with learning. Um, and it doesn't really address how we move per se, right? A lot of their research is more about, um, how we process information, um, how we remember certain things, how we can retain or enhance, um, memory by various methods, whatever that may be, but motor control learning that the distinction becomes the learning is not necessarily what you might learn from a book, but it's learning from learning skills, right? Skills that require some type of body movement. And then there's a whole component of learning in educational psychology. Um, In educational psychology, there's, they talk about learning too, and usually learning styles come from that. And I get asked questions all the time about learning styles, whether you're visual, everybody says they're visual, believe it or not. Um, But when it comes to motor control and learning, we have no scientific evidence for learning styles. Um, I was once asked this question. I did, I was uh, the motor control and learning principal scientist for USA Track and Field. Um, And I had a really nice opportunity. I just work with the athletes that they thought can win medals. Mm -hmm. And so I was on that team for a while. And then the head sports science guy, you know, had the question about learning styles because someone was trying to sell USA track and field, some materials on learning styles. Um, And then I kind of, I had a double take because through my undergraduate career and my, my graduate work, I never, that was something we never discussed or really talked about in the research or in any kind of research meetings or anything like that. So I was like, oh, let me, you know, double check. Um, So I asked colleagues, I do some reviews of my own. The only things that I come up with is basically there is no evidence in motor control and motor learning, right, as it's required to learn movements or control movements about about learning styles. Um, The only exception is really based on, and this is what I talk about um, with coaches. I run a, I run a coaching education program with John Dunnigan called the skilled coaching Alliance, Mm -hmm. uh, where we, we teach coaches how to use motor control and learning. Um, And so in, 
in our discussions there, I say really the only styles that we have for learning when it comes to movement is not necessarily a style, but it's based on what I call perceptual needs. So there are aspects of movement, human movement that require spatial orientation. So how you observe yourself in space, yes. right? How you position yourself in space or maybe even how you sequence yourself in space or sequence yourself in, a, in an action. And then there's timing characteristics and then there are force characteristics. So I say it depends on what the, pers what the need is in the, in the movement. So if you're looking at something like position, people are going to be a little bit more visually dominant when you're trying to learn position, because that's, that's the best perceptual avenue to be able to communicate that, but try to learn force characteristics, right? Say you're on a, on a force plate and you're looking at ground reaction forces of the golf swing, try looking at that right. and trying to learn from that, right? <laughs> you can't do that. Right. And then also try looking at timing. You can't do timing out either. And so people always say that they're visual learners until you give them something related to movement that you can't see. And so timing, timing issues related to human movement are typically done, uh, better done through the auditory system. So that's why you have a lot of kind of cadence, metronome work mm -hmm. when you're learning timing. And then from a ground force or force perspective, that's going to be a little bit more proprioceptive in nature. And that's why um, I use a strategy, strategy called uh, proprioceptive priming that helps. It's basically feel, uh, getting people to understand feels, intensities of feels, and those, those sorts of things. And so in the motor control and learning context, there's really no learning style per se, right? I'll just leave that to the educational psychology literature. And I, from what I know of that literature, it's even kind of being debunked from from that literature. But at least as far as motor control and learning, we don't have learning styles. It's just what part of the movement you're trying to learn and what's the best avenue to communicate that to um, the mover. Right. Well, that, yeah, that, it makes sense. So the differentiation is one is, uh, as you mentioned, psychological and how the. I, well, I like you, I want to leave it to the to the academic world. I'm not even going to try to explain it. And, and if the listeners are wondering, just Google it and, and you can get a differentiation between motor learning and intelligence learning. Uh, that we, we could do probably a series of podcasts on that. But yeah. I, I want to focus on what you, you do in this motor learning because it's very beneficial if uh, people are going to get introduced to you if they haven't already. And I think it's will help them immensely because as Doc Scott, when he told me about you and what you do, it, it when once he described it, I said, yes, that is an avenue that has been, I think, left widely undiscovered by the masses. Yeah. Uh, especially in the tech-driven world that we're in today and not utilizing what you do in, uh, with that. Yeah, for sure. Scott Scott has a really um, unique perspective because we're close. We're friends and we're collaborative, collaborators um, in in research on the academic side but we also collaborate sometimes we overlap players on you know the golf ball mechanics side and so you know sport performance is like a it's like a pie and you have different pieces that play their role you have a you know you have a strength coach and then you have a nutritionist you have a strategist you have a swing coach mm -hmm. you have a biomechanist um, some teams are including um, now that they're starting to under or discover motor control and learning you have someone like me on the team. Um, but Scott and I work w in what we do. They're very complementary to each other because you have the biomechanics part. How should we move, right? Whether it be moving safer or moving more maximally, which oftentimes don't go together. Um, so if you want distance, there's a certain way you can move biomechanically. If you want to move safer, there's a certain way that you can move biomechanically. And so if you look at an analytical part, how should we be moving or sorry, what we should be doing from a movement standpoint, then that's the analysis part of it. So then how do you communicate? How do you teach? How do you train someone to be able to do the movements that, that the 3D analysis, the biomechanical analysis wants you to do? And that's where the motor control and learning part come in. Um, the simplest analogy um, that I can make for that is um, a close colleague and friend of mine is Mark Blackburn. And we overlap and we, I help, we help each other with players and coaching, et cetera. And how we use it is it's ingredients and a recipe. 
so the ingredients come from a swing coach. What, what do you need to do? And the recipe comes from the motor control and learning principles. How do you practice it? Mm -hmm. And so that's why Scott and I, or coaches like Mark and I have, um, a lot, we have a complimentary, a very complimentary relationship because of how we view the role of the different sports science component, particular motor control and learning. So it's how can we provide instructions from a coaching perspective that communicates more effectively to your, to the player, how they should move. It's one thing to say, get your trail elbow closer to your trunk on the downswing, right? It's a different, it's entirely different, statistically different to say close the space between there. Now, people might think of that and go, oh, that's just a play of words. Well, it's a play of words, but it has a statistically different effect on your movement, right? W this would is you not say, by chance or anything. Sorry, not to interrupt, but would you say, to just get to give the listener an analogy who, who might not be a scientific type and, and mm -hmm. trying to grasp hold of what you're saying, would that be kind of similar to, to the differentiation between, let's say, language amongst different parts of a country or language from in English compared to say Spanish, that there's not a direct translation and that you uh, could say the same thing, but each, uh, nationality, so to speak, would have a slightly different right. interpretation. I would strip it down even more at the fundamental level. Are you getting people to think about their body while they're moving? That's one way. That's the most common way. Or are you getting people to think about the effects of their movements while they're moving? Mm -hmm. Right. So a simple analogy for that would be um, lead wrist flexion in the downswing versus handle shaft orientation right in the downswing. Um, and obviously, I mean, that's just an example, right? that highlights the distinction between the two. And so are you, are you a player or are you a coach that gives movement related instruction to give the player, to have the player think about their body movements or are you the type of coach or are you the type of player that when you're thinking about your swing, you're thinking about the effects of those movements. So simple things like in the back swing, it's pretend you're or at the top, pretend you're holding a, uh, you know, a, a drink tray, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Um, my dear friend and colleague, John Dunnigan, is awesome with this in the coaching world where he uses belt buckle a lot. He uses, we use um, shirt buttons a yes. lot. When Plackets you hear on the shirt, it, belt buckle, yeah, I use those a lot. It's, in, in particular, it's forms of measurement for where's the butt end of the club point at, at address. Yeah. And it's really like those subtle plays on words, it's make significant changes and they're real differences. There are things that we see in the research, the whole body of evidence in the research that highlight this, um, whether it be how you're activating your muscles, right? Um, how you're using the ground and we can measure it with ground reaction forces. We can measure it with 3d, whatever it may be. Um, and even in the endurance world, right? When you don't focus on how your body is moving, um, your endurance capabilities go up. And so just the subtle plain words, you get a really strong benefit from it. That, that's interesting. Um, and and I, I, I've got to have you on more to, so we can just get off on these <laughs> tangents and just let rip. Um, but I, uh, I, I want to touch on a couple other topics. And, and one of them was uh, not long ago amongst, I wasn't, I mean, I, I threw in my two cents, but there was some discussion on social media about, between some trainers and some coaches and other things on the difference between or, or uh, talent, which is what I consider or what, what I assume that they meant to be a predisposition to be good at something. Yeah. And, and my argument was, okay, define what talent is, first of all. And mm -hmm. I said, if you're talking about a physical predisposition, like somebody who's seven feet is going to be much more adept at playing basketball than somebody five foot two, Mm. Or, or uh, like a Michael Phelps who has a, a ratio, and I think David Epstein talked about this in, in his books, um, the physical predisposition to be good. If that's a definition of talent that we can establish from the beginning, yes, I believe that there's a talent, but I was leaning more towards, no, it's a learning of, and a skill acquisition that will determine the difference between somebody's ability to, to perform at a better level than somebody else's. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. So there's always the interplay between what you, what I say, the gifts from mom and dad, what you get genetically, mm -hmm. and then the nurture, um, the nurture component, which in my context is how, how good are your training and learning and instructional programs. And so from a motor control and learning perspective, um, we're born with motor abilities that mom and dad give us. And not everybody has the same um, level of motor abilities within a specific motor ability, right? We can just talk about speed of arm movement, right? If we were to really make it super simple and say, all right, everybody's born with a particular speed of arm movement and not everybody is the fastest, right? Or not everybody can have the fastest um, arm speed movement. Some people are predispositioned to have it faster than others. Like a type 2A, B, and C muscle? Yeah, you can go down to, you can go on muscle type, right? But then there's also the motor abilities of just um, object interaction ability or object um, manipulation and object contact abilities, right? So like hitting balls mm -hmm. or being able to manipulate a ball. Like you have to orient a golf club that, Accuracy demands to orient a golf club to be successful is very, very different from orienting a baseball bat to be successful. Um, and so those motor ability demands associated with that, people are born with those types of abilities, and some people are born with higher levels and lower level abilities. Um, that's oftentimes the difference. Uh, we, you know, like a group of golf practitioners and I, we call them superpowers, Roy McIlroy has a superpower. Tiger Woods has a superpower. Dustin Johnson has a superpower. Those guys hit the ball far. Um, what about Colin Morikawa? Doesn't hit the ball as far, but also has a superpower, and he's probably the best at tour with his iron play. Right. So every if we look at golf, every different player at the highest levels has a different superpower, and so that separates them from the right the talent, their motor abilities to. Um, the player, maybe there's a player who practiced two times as much as they did, but didn't get to the levels. And so at the elite levels, it's always going to be an interplay of what you're born with and what you're nurtured with or how you train and how you, how you learn and how you're instructed. Um, but one of the wonderful things about golf and why golf is a part of my family in terms of us being participants in the game. Mm -hmm. but also what I do from a research and a, a consulting standpoint. And a wonderful thing about golf and the reason why it lends so well to motor control and learning is because the tallest and biggest or heaviest player doesn't always hit the ball the furthest. Right? So um, the need for physical attributes, just as height and weight, are far less required in the skill of golf as say basketball or football. So because of that, there's a higher demand on the skill side. That's where a lot of differences come is the skill side. So you have, you know, we have shorter players that play really well at a high level, like, uh, like Xander plays at a high level being probably five ten or less. Colin Morikawa plays at a high level being five nine. Or, um, Roy McIlroy, same thing. Ricky mm -hmm. Fowler, the same thing. So a lot of short golfers, there are a lot of tall golfers that do that, but you don't necessarily find that if we take the same, if we make the analogy in basketball, how many Muggsy Bodes and Spud Webbs, guys that are under 5'10", that are best in the world in basketball? Right. It, it's diminishing. Like Steph Curry Correct. is the only one that comes to mind now that that's, it's like the NBA, Correct. it's like distance in, in the PGA Tour is starting to make some players obsolete the same way the NBA seems to be gravitating more towards seven footers with the ability to dribble where 30 years ago that was unheard of. Yeah. It's just the, the anthropometric requirements or the physical traits of other athletes are just weighted heavier in the other sports. Cause you bring up Steph, Steph Curry, but Steph Curry's still over six feet tall. Right. And then when Steph Curry was getting drafted, one of the knocks about him was that he was too short and he right. was too light or he was too weak. And now he's the best player in the NBA. So he, but he's still over six feet tall. <laughs> we don't go into golf saying you have to be over six feet tall to be successful. That's ludicrous, right? You can pretty much see, you can look at, you look at a player's ball striking and be like, you know, that's a player, regardless of whether they're tall or short. Mm -hmm. And when you sit, talk about ball striking, right, that's ability, someone's ability to not only coordinate their movements, but coordinate their movements with an 
while manipulating object to manipulate a different object, right? And so that's really motor ability um, dependent, but it's also very skill dependent. And those things can be, those can be nurtured and developed much more so than you can't nurture and develop height, right? Or even running speed. You can only nurture and develop running speed to an extent um, within what your physical abilities, uh, your individual constraints, what your genetics allow you to do. Um, would you, so motor skill development is a skill that can, can be developed regardless of what DNA you have from your lineage, um, what your size is or anything like that. It's something that you can be taught in a, in a, in a similar fashion that some of these, like a Bryson DeChambeau has taken his distance game to a whole nother level. So motor skill development, it would fall into that category. Absolutely. I mean, you look at, well, Bryson's a really good example. People see the distance that he hits the ball now, but what gets, what doesn't get talked about as much is how accurate he is at, at that speed. Distances. Yes. That's amazing. Like you, you have a lot of guys on tour um, that could probably hit it that far, but choose not to. Tony Finau is probably the, comes to mind right away. That's yeah. I was thinking about him too. And there's, right. there's, there's footage of him hitting it just as far, but he has to take a bigger swing. And I mean, this is, I don't know anything about, you know, Tony Finau's camp and what he does, but that's a good example of there are people who can hit it just as far, but they choose not to. And you have to ask, well, why do they choose not to? Right. It could be completely psychological where they fear that they won't hit the ball as well, or it could be completely data driven where they say, well, when I have this kind of club head speed and ball speed, the dispersion is this. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, and strategically, I don't, they, they may be saying, I don't want to play with that. Right. Um, I'm not privy to those, but you have to wonder why a lot of tour players can hit it. Maybe not as far, but increase their speed to what they're playing with on regular tournament days. Um, but he hits the ball far, he bombs it, but he's like a lot of times hitting, he's hitting the fairway with it also. Right. That, that's a scary um, thing. And so there's an accuracy component there that is not, I'm going to lift weights, right? Accuracy is not, I'm going to lift weights more and I'm going to lift weights faster. Accuracy is how I'm going to train it or how my motor abilities allow me to orient the club face in a specific position where um, it, can, it won't go OB or it'll stay in play. And so I think when you look at the very high levels, the elite levels, you always want to have the combination genetically talented and then awesome training and practice design and programs, right? That's the ultimate. Um, there are other things that are associated with it, like what is their home life like, right? That viewers on TV never understand. Yes. Um, there's all that, all that external stuff. But yeah, we would love to have the player that has, you know, genetic gifts and who's in an awesome awesome training program. I think what I'm experience on with the players that I have professionally is they understand they're like, Hey, I'm at this level, um, on tour genetically, whatever it may be, ball striking wise, but mm -hmm. I'm looking for the extra edge. And oftentimes that extra edge could be, I'm practicing for anywhere from two to eight hours a day. How can I dial that in based on what the science is saying? Right? And so usually they come to me and I can, um, give them evidence-based programs on how to learn better than their competitor is, is, is it, learning. It, it, as you had mentioned practice plans, it, it, how, how would that differ? Or how would it be similar to the, the periodization when I emailed you that, uh, like, yeah. do, like Dr. Greg half discussed on the show, uh, the Tudor Bompas of the world. So yeah, as it's related to, to weight training, is it similar to to what you're talking about when you, when you devise a practice plan for one of your players? Yeah, it really is. You know, in my, when, when I was doing my PhD work, I was really um, fortunate to become really good friends and colleagues with um, a biomechanist who was a track and field coach and getting his PhD. His name's, his name's Mike Young, probably one of a super talented, bright um, strength. I guess you call him the strength domain, um, but he has a PhD in biomechanics. And so he introduced me to the world of track and field where um, at the time, the guy's doing really, really good periodization within the track and field speed um, areas were guys like Lauren Seagrave, Dan Path, 
um, and Mike and Bushek Snader and Mike was, you know, kind of the young guy in that tree. Um, and I was immersed in that being a motor control and learning person, right? I didn't come from a strength, strength background, mm -hmm. um, at least in a sport performance strength background. Um, and so I was immersed in that in graduate school. I was immersed in that by my associations with them um, and by the work that I did with the USA Track and Field. So that influenced how I view skills and how I reviewed the literature and skills um, in the research and, and kind of saw how people needed to progress based on certain motor learning variables that needed to change. Um, and that's why I'd say there's strength periodization, but there's also skill periodization. So where someone starts, where I start with a tour player is very, very different with how I start with a junior, a junior golfer, right? A competitive junior right. golfer. How they progress is completely different. Um, my two kids play competitive junior golf and how I design for them is very, very different from how I design from a tour player while there might be common elements of where we start and how we progress is very, very, is, is different. Um, Does that have different... to, to, to deal with as it was in the, in the old Russian Bulgarian literature, uh, you have the different ages of chronological, biological and training. Uh, well, there are components of that, right? So then we're talking about like youth within the developmental stages of youth mm -hmm. um, and what you want to stress and those types of things. So that plays a part also. And so if we take, we take youth, for example, like my, my daughter is nine and my son is 12. Um, just by comparing him and looking at his, his physical traits, he's probably hasn't really started puberty in its real sense. And my daughter obviously has not. And so how we do physical training and skill training, those proportions will change based on their maturation rates. So I want, I'm not going to be as willing to spend time until I can get a hormonal bump um, on a decent amount of physical training, although they do, they do physical training, mm -hmm. but the investment is a lot less because they don't, they won't get that hormonal bump, but there are other things that they get from it. So that distribution changes as they mature. Um, but from, it's more the difference between juniors and adults, the reason why they differ on where I start them in a skilled training program is because, or sorry, I don't want to say, competitive juniors and, and tour players is because I can give something for a tour player and it's just way too easy and simple for them. Mm -hmm. Like they'll get it right away. So it's, it's just like, it's a rep for them, but it's not a very fruitful rep for them. Um, but because the juniors don't have as much experience, they need those additional reps, right? Or those doing the same thing a little bit for a little bit longer. Um, so it has to also do with their experience with the activity and their, the knowledge gap. Yeah. So it would, it, uh, uh, I always, have always said when I had, like I do a beginner's clinic and, and I, yeah. I, I get a lot of, they're, they're gung ho to get going because now they've taken the step to at least take some instruction. They've been to the range a number of times and they're getting frustrated because they're not advancing. So they'll take a, a group clinic. And I, I tell them, especially because I know that they're so anxious to get better that they want to go out and practice every day. And I've always told beginners or novices, whatever word you want to use, that it's far better for them to practice more often for shorter durations because their brain is not going to absorb and their muscles don't have the strength for what the act that they're performing. And if they try to go long periods, they're not going to absorb it. You might as well spin your wheels. Yeah. But that longer, the, the better players can practice for extended periods of time, but then they would take more time off for, for the adaptation to take hold. Is that on the right path? No, totally. Yeah. That's you're right on. Um, you're right on with that. There is a concept called practice distribution that says uh, work spread out over longer periods of time is better than the same amount total hours of work in a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a variety of reasons for that. I think one of the things that you have to account for, um, you know, we talked about intelligence learning at the very beginning. That's different from motor learning. This is a physical uh, workload capacity uh, that you have to consider um, with learning motor skills. Mm -hmm. um, so on the very, on the very high levels, like um, with the tour players that, that I work with, a lot of them are monitoring uh, their workload, right? So workload may adjust, or what I do with them may adjust based on what their workload is or what, how the quality of their sleep may be. Um, 
you have to account for things like that, or you have to account for, did they do something really heavy in the gym um, that may have an influence on how they're developing their skill, right? So those have, those have to be, um, um, those have to be accounted for. Um, a good friend and colleague of mine, um, Ben Shear, probably one of the, you know, one of the best in golf in, in, in physical training. Um, yeah, he, have a he's lot earmarked of, to, to, for me to reach out and come yeah. on the show. So if he's, he's listening, you're, you're, you're going to get a note from me. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a good one. Um, we collaborate a lot on players and, um, the conversations that we have about what, what is appropriate, when is appropriate based on our respective pieces, um, is a very important for a player who's looking at small margins, um, of improvement, even large margins of improvement. And so, you know, some people like re players that have built a really good team are looking about how you integrate these pieces, right? Some other players don't even have the pieces, <laughs> <laughs> right? So there's a, there's like a gap there. Um, there's a gap with some players and that's what the race is right now. Um, the races is, is some players have understand and are looking to build the right team and some players, um, maybe are looking have a team and there are just less parts to the team to contribute to, you know, the really small margins that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, you know, in my opinion with coaches, you know, the, the, the coaches that I'm looking that I work with, you know, in my SCA program with John Dunnigan is, um, they're the coaches that are going, okay, we, we have a good handle on the different ways that you can swing right? It's not even the method coaches, right? So you have some coaches that are just teaching one swing and they're good with that. <clears throat> These are coaches that are saying, okay, I understand my toolbox is big to be able to fit a player to how they would swing well. Now they're saying, how can I communicate this better? How can they train better? How can I teach this better? And usually those are the coaches that, you know, I have a lot of, a lot of interaction with. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, hey, so, you, you mentioned Mark Blackburn, and I, it, I've talked about this with, with students and colleagues that, that say, and I, because I, I have said, when Mark got te National Teacher of the Year, I said, he is exceptionally deserving, and, and some local people didn't know about him, and I said, well, I'll tell you what, and this is not a knock on, on any of his tour players, but if you took his tour players and put them up against the DJs and the Brysons, they would not look as athletic. It, meaning mm. that their swing would not be as, as we talk, let, let's call it natural or talented. But I yeah. said, he, 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 what he's getting out of his players and them winning and competing on a regular basis, yeah. I said, that, that's genius unto itself. Yeah, he's maximizing. And the other thing you could look at too, which is I think a hallmark of a really good coach is, do all your players swing the same way? Correct. And if you look at his players, they don't swing the same way. Um, not even close. You know, we'll, yeah. <laughs> and he's done... Um, you know, he's done a really good job of, and other, like there's, there's a group of coaches that do this well is they can say, how do you move, right? They test and assess and what swings work for you based on how you move. I really think it's, you know, there's an evolutionary process in every discipline, right? If you just kind of look at labor forces, I mean, things are becoming automated now, mm -hmm. right? It's the evolution of, of, of labor, so to speak, like I put that in air quotes. There's an evolution of coaching, right? From a, a, from a big world perspective, if you look at baseball, the coaches who are, who are embracing um, advanced statistics are doing well. Um, if you look even to basketball, right? And if and how I look at it in golf is the co the golf coaches who are interested in how we motor learn or how we learn movements better, they're going to further separate themselves from the coaches that are still, you know, you know, like teaching, like it's a biomechanical analysis. Um, and there's all, there's all sorts of, they're looking to get constantly better rather than staying in those, you know, in those areas. And, um, you know, I often joke about this, you know, with John Dunning and I'm like, dude, there are like some people that call themselves motor learning experts, John, and I'll put the, I'll put you against them any day. Right. Just because of how, how he knows this stuff. And, you know, guys like Mark and John, the same way. It's, it's not about, they're to the point where 
to them, it's not so much about what they know of the golf swing, although they're still, you know, they're still investigating the golf swing. But the difference maker is how they can get their players better. And it's not oftentimes, you know, the quantitative movement per se, but it's how they're communicating, how they're dealing with players that, um, you know, the off course stuff, how are they worrying them in those types of situations? And so, you know, I think those are the, that's, those are the coaches with kind of cutting edge approaches to being better coaches. Yeah. And, and the information's out there with things like Apple watch or Garmin or the aura rings and, and all these things that, that are quantitative to measurement and, t- and giving uh, information and feedback that, that if, if, if like you, you know, as you're developing these things and, a player says, well, geez, after the round, I need to go out to the range and work on this. And, and you or someone else there says, no, we, we think you're go ahead and hit a few putts, but you based off what the data we have, you need to go back to the room and just chill out. It, yeah. The, the load might be a lot lower. And, you know, I have, that's kind of one of the luxuries that I have working on teams is I always have to preface this, whatever players, coaches, whomever asked me that like, Oh, can you help me with the golf swing? And I go, no, you don't understand. I'm not a golf. I'm not a golf coach. <laughs> I'm not a golf coach. You know, back to that ingredients recipe scenario is if you have the ingredients, then I can build a recipe, right, for the ingredients that you give me. But I, I need ingredients, whether it be from a biomechanist um, or a, a primarily it comes from a coach. And so, you know, I my interaction with players works in a variety of different ways. Sometimes I work just with a coach primarily and the coach distributes that information to the players. Sometimes I interface with only the player and then the player gives me an ingredients from the coach um, that way. And so my relationships or how I interact could be in a variety of different ways who I'm seeing, you know, who I'm talking to the most, mm-hmm. but really all it comes down to is I need ingredients to be able to do, my my movement change programs there are skill change programs that i can create and i usually base that off of you know their golf statistics um those sorts of things are easy to identify weaknesses in the games and then program program around those um um, and there are also you know other things that you can program around but the, the movement related things you know i need ingredients from coaches to be able to you know and it works both ways. So I always tell players, it's like, if you're working on, if what your coach tells you to work on is not good for you, I will train really well. I will give you a program that will train you really well to swing how you're not supposed to swing. <laughs> <laughs> right? It works both ways. And so it kind of goes to show how important those ingredients are. Like, I don't never minimize what I do. Sh- Some coaches that are fearful see what I do and say I'm infringing on their territory. Right. I think those are the coaches who don't have such a good understanding of what I do. The coaches who do, I actually emphasize the need for a coach because what I do doesn't happen unless you have those good ingredients. And it's you have to have not only good, you have to have the accurate ones. And And there has to be a crossover at some point. I'm very good friends with a guy named Mike Obarski. And Mike has got he's 70 now, but he, he, he has been club fitting for 40 years and he's yeah. got data on 35,000 fittings over that time. And he's got more data on club fitting than, than just about anybody I know. And he, he's, he's exceptionally good at what he does. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, re- when I was look, playing, prof- you know, in early 2000 to 2006, he was working with some, some tour pros uh, on their clubs. And w- one time, one of the, the tour coaches got mad at him Say you, you you're supposed to do the clubs. You're not their swing coach. And and he said, look, if their clubs, older clubs, were causing them to have a swing issue, and they come to me, and I say, you here's what your here's what was being caused, and here's what I took out, so you don't have to do this anymore. He said, yeah. hey, that's not swing advice. That's just telling them the cause and effect relationship of what they had to do versus now what they don't have to do. Yeah. And then once that was ironed out, you know th- things work smoothly. But I. I I could just see what you're saying to where you have a team and it, there might be an overlap. And if you sometimes if egos get in the way uh, of, of the wrong coach and you're trying to help somebody, you're like, Hey, I'm not coaching or swing. <laughs> yeah. There is going to be a little overlap. And I think what you say, it's a team dynamic. And so one of the important things about a team is knowing your role within the team and then being a good participant 
um, or member of that team. Um, mm-hmm. And so ego is always, especially if it's ego and um, you're not the player, right? Because really it's not about you, it's about the player. Right. Um, they're the ones, right, that are hitting the shots. They're the ones um, that are putting in the time. And so, you know, I think a lot of and they, if you think about it from perspective, it's just you're just you're just assisting them. Yeah, you got to remember right. that you're working for somebody who's a player and you're all contributing. The, the goal for everybody is for that player's success, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I, it could, you could get lost in that a little bit and, and forget the direction that, that you, the goal that you started from the beginning. Oh, absolutely. I mean, everybody has, it's, it's, it would, it would be naive to say that people don't have egos. Everybody has an ego. It's just a matter of the extent and um, whether they, how they're applying or how, when they're, when the ego is, is being shown. <laughs> <laughs> Did, have, have you read or heard of the book peak by Anders Ericsson? Yeah. So, um, I, the, yes, I, I thought that was very, in, a very interesting book. Yeah. A lot of people ask me if I've, um, read the, that was a follow up to, um, a book that I think was the results were misinterpreted. So he had to come out and write that book. I'm not going to name the book. Because just read Peak and you don't need to worry about the other book. Yeah, the other book um, was a number about twenty years ago, wasn't it? The original that he uh, put out. It was a it was a bestseller. Um, the author writes some other books that I'm just I'll just keep it to this. It was a really bad interpretation of Andres Ericsson's work. Okay. <laughs> and Andres Ericsson, like, I think he saw that, so he goes, "I need to make this better," because he was using he used his name and he used his research. So just read Peak. That's the much that's a much better book. But people ask me if I read the book. I didn't read the book, but um, you know, my wife and kids and I will always make fun of me because I don't read books. And I go, I don't read books because I read textbooks and research articles. And so I didn't read Andres Erickson's book, but I was very familiar with all of his research articles. Um, you know, my graduate and postgraduate work. You know, one thing I want to ask you about because I, I listened to one of your lectures um, online, and and I found it fascinating, and and I was. If this would have been a, a, few, a number of years ago, I'd have said, "God, he, he's he's crazy. This can't. There's no way this can be true." But <laughs> n- n- as as you get older and you learn some things, and and, and that was about uh, 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 hand dominance in particular. Uh, yeah. uh, th- that that example, and, and I'll, t- I'll I'll preface it with, with where I came from, and and the question I have first, and then I'll, I'll explain a little bit on why I I I have a better understanding of of what you're talking about. So. My question would be is because you had used the uh, how kids will reach for something with one hand. And mm-hmm. my question would be if, if they're still don't have any really de- mental development or ner- nervous system development to be predisposed to, to have one side develop over the other. Why would they reach with one hand more often than the other? Mm-hmm. And then the reason that, that I, I, I do find you're in that topic very interesting and and believe how you said it, it's a it's a development of skill because you don't use people in, especially in this country will use one hand predominantly and not use both is many years ago i did martial arts and, and some of the, the teachers w- would show us video of of uh chinese artists where they and, it, and this was in a tai chi class where they were painting the, those beautiful waterfall type paintings and they'd be painting one section of the painting with one hand and another section of the painting with another hand and because and, they were talking about balance and you had to, you know this and that and, and the other thing, and I'm like, I, I, it, it hit me there that yes, you can, it is you can develop yourself to do things regardless of what you might be told as a kid or you might think. Yeah. Um. So it, it is that's why I I said when you said that I said yeah ten years ago I said he's crazy but I do understand it but to my question how doesn't wouldn't a kid based off their DNA or their structure and everything else be predisposed to have a, a hand dominance? Yeah. So, I mean, let's just take for the sake of argument, let's just say, okay, someone does have a predisposition, right? Like you have your right hand or some right handers. It still doesn't mean that they can't develop their other side as equally as well as, as their quote unquote preferred or chosen side. And so, I'll back way back in the day, my childhood, um, there, my brother played baseball with a, uh, a kid named Jimmy Edmonds. And I don't know if you, if that name sounds familiar it with you, but Jim, Jimmy Edmonds played, won a, um, 
think he won a World Series with the Angels, and then he played for the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, but Jimmy Edmonds was a right-hander, naturally. Mm-hmm. But his dad was like, he was originally going to be a pitcher. He was an outfielder and really good hitter. He was a really good center fielder and left-handed hitter in the major leagues. But his dad was originally, when he was young, training him to be a pitcher. And he said, well, pit, left-handed pitchers are um, are going to be in more demand, right? So you're just going to throw left and you're going to throw left and hit left. And so he threw left, um, but he's a, he's a natural right-hander. Um, and so I think there are a lot of – you can look at, look at the tour players that can hit the ball left-handed. <laughs> well, I mean, look, right. M- Mac O'Grady would probably be the prototype yeah. for that. And I think you just imagine the number of the number of reps that they do one side compared to the other, mm-hmm. and how good it l- looks the opposite way. So I look at it more from, you know, my my um, my undergraduate advisor, the late great Dick Schmidt, who passed away um, a little while ago. He uh, authored the schema theory, which basically described what was called the generalized motor program. Um, and that has a lot of res- uh, evidence or a lot has a lot of support in the research. It basically says people have these motor programs that allow them to complete or execute different kinds of actions, right? So let's just, for simplic- simplicity's sake, we'll take the golf swing, right? Um, it's a little bit more complex than that, but we need to simplify here. Um, he says, well, the motor actions say the motor program for the golf swing is not um, is for the right, the right side and left side, right? The right side and left side are just details of the same motor program, right? And it's just what we decide, to, what we choose to practice more. Mm-hmm. Um, so from the generalized or from schema theory, there really isn't any right side, left side mention at all. It's just what is the action? What are the important components of that action and what are the details of that action and then you train accordingly and so and then there are a lot of examples i mean i've i mean this is something that i've done with my son is in my son started off playing um competitive baseball he's on a really good baseball team was a really good hitter on a really good baseball team and he had left-handed um and that was a choice right there's a strategic choice by me because left-handed you're close to first base um Left-handed, I knew that he was going to play golf right-handed, and I knew that over his lifetime he was going to swing a ton from the right side, so I wanted him to swing baseball bat from the left side because both are asymmetrical movement activities. Right. Um, and if, if you look at any of the predictive injury-based studies, a lot of it has to do with asymmetry, um, body asymmetry, right? right, or muscular asymmetry. And so... That was just me doing that, and he was a really good hitter in baseball, although um, he was, quote-unquote, right-handed, right? He threw right-handed. Um, and so in his younger days, he doesn't play baseball anymore. Um, he just primarily plays golf and surfs. But in his <laughs> – kid, kid got it made. He better enjoy it <laughs> oh, now. <laughs> I mean, the kid, the kid surfs in the morning, and then he plays golf in the afternoon. I'm like, that's a heck of a two-a-day, man. I envy that um, kid. But – uh I mean, then he just, now he just plays golf. But if he, if he picks up the baseball bat, he's swinging that thing, he's swinging that thing left-handed, um, and then you know it comes in handy in some some in some areas where he has to hit a golf ball left-handed because of lie or something like mm-hmm. that. It come in handy. Um, but yeah, I think we limit we limit ourselves if we think about right-handedness, left-handedness, especially at a higher higher level, because if I'm more, like think about accuracy, accuracy isn't accuracy isn't side dominated right it's side it looks side dominated because we practice more with our right than our left but accuracy like me throwing a ball to a target is not side dominated and so like if i if i grew up right um nurturing a pitcher and that pitcher could throw not equally as well but almost like relatively good with the non-preferred side from an accuracy training standpoint, you know how I double my I double my accuracy workload training if I could do that, hmm. right? Because now 
you know, why do pitchers rest in the major leagues? Because it's right side dominant. They got a resting arm. So what are they doing? So for me, from a motor control standpoint, I'm like, man, if there's anything they can do to work on their accuracy, but not, you know, um, increase unduly increase the workload of their of their body, that would be fantastic. Um, so would it be throwing left handed on off the base? Throw out the opposite hand. So you you, you would work on that accuracy. You would control. prescribe to them say go play catch with your opposite hand. I would do that, yes. That would be something like low level, better than sitting around watching. Just doing nothing. Like they, they sit in the bullpen yeah. with their jacket on and they're spitting their ses- or, uh, sunflower seeds all over the place. It, it's better yeah. that they would throw. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was something. I think um, there was a, there's a, there's a trainer called, uh, his name was Vern, his name's Vern Gambetta. Um, I met him just briefly during my graduate school days that he was a strength coach, I believe at some point for the white Sox, And he was actually talking about doing those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's understanding the accuracy, accuracy thing from a motor control standpoint, isn't necessarily a side dominant issue, right? The accuracy thing is just your ability to organize your movements Right. Regardless of whether it's right, left, with your using your arms or legs, it's your ability to organize your movements in a way that can it, it propels the object to where you want it to be. It, right. So it really just becomes a movement organization and coordination um, uh, challenge. And it, it wouldn't be the same for each side based off of number of different factors. Uh, no, I mean. I, I think naturally, like if you're a right-handed pitcher in the game or you're a right-handed golfer in tournaments, you're going to be competing with a quote-unquote preferred side, mm-hmm. right? So that's going to be trained more. So, I mean, in a perfect – like, so you're going to be – the non-preferred side is going to be quote-unquote weaker in, in strength, right? You won't be able to hit the ball as far in golf or you might be less accurate. Um, but think of all the – but think of all the other things that you'd be, do, you'd be doing maybe from – um, a asymmetry accounting for the asymmetry in the golf swing and the development that occurs, range of motion, muscle tissue, etc. Right. Um, that you would be balancing out, etc. And at the same time, working on skill related things such as accuracy. Mm-hmm. Right. I'll just kind of gen- use that as a very, very general term: accuracy. Right. It could be accuracy of face contact, or be accuracy of where the ball lands. But you could be working all all of those things if. And their side didn't work. Like my good, my good, my my good friend and colleague, uh, John Dunnigan. He, uh, I think he had a. Uh, he's a right-handed golfer, and I think he had a left shoulder issue. But his daughter plays, loves to play with his daughter, so he just learned how to play. Sometimes he'll play the go- He'll play golf left-handed because um, you know he wants to play golf with his family. Um, and so he still. It's not as good as the the right side per se, but he could move the ball around pretty darn good. You see it from the left side. Hmm. Um, it's pretty darn good. And so I, I'm not, I don't like, I'm just saying there are, that's just complimentary stuff, right. That you can do. It's not bulk of what you're doing training wise. Um, we're just talking about some complimentary things that can happen. You know, I, I've been wanting to ask you this question because it used to drive me crazy when I was getting off of my professional playing career was when I was getting into judo and jujitsu and i would still... I train jujitsu also yeah, all right so um oh, it's so good so, so yeah I, it was a love-hate relationship i hated going to the gym right because i just <laughs> i mean i, I knew i was going to get beat on like i, I was yeah. a white belt and and it was just torture but then when i left that the sense of accomplishment was phenomenal i loved it yeah i couldn't wait you to always, go back you're always glad that you 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 stepped on the mat afterwards yes. but getting there yeah there's a little and, and you're pump. basically thanking somebody for kicking your ass for for a couple hours but what drove me crazy was like because i I, all right so i would still play golf during the day i'd hit balls because you know less i wasn't doing a lot of lessons yet and i was just getting segueing into it and if i would play and then go to class that evening it was like my brain had trouble making the 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 changeover from being and i don't know if it was being a, a elite at one level and then beginner at another, but th- there was like, just something that did not work. And I'm just like, why is it so hard sometimes to get turn one off and the other one on? You know, I, I actually think there is um, quite a bit of similarity. I, some people 
have some uh, MMA jujitsu friends who would like kind of look at me weird, but I think there's a lot of similarity between golf and jujitsu. Um, and one is if you've ever trained jujitsu before, you know that it's more than just about being the strongest. Obviously, the strongest helps, but the, sh- the biggest guy doesn't always win in jujitsu. No, it's a chess match. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of skill associated with jujitsu, and you know that when something has a high, and when a sport has a high demand of skill associated uh, associated with it, it's not always a try harder sport. So oftentimes you can try harder in jujitsu, but it, it's not ga- you're not getting a return on your mm-hmm. effort investment. Um, same as golf, right? Golf is not a try harder sport like defense is in basketball. You try harder in golf and see how that works for you. Golf is more about have you developed the skill properly over a given period of time. And can you implement so, it at the right time? Correct. And so that's why I always think that there's a really, really uh, close similarity in, in terms of skill demand um, from jiu-jitsu and golf is because you have to be skilled and coordinated or know the technique really well. And having, mind you said, jiu-jitsu was, is primarily built for the weaker, smaller opponent to be able to survive the bigger opponent, Mm -hmm. right? And so by nature, because it's for the smaller, um, you know, the smaller athlete or the smaller fighter, you have to be skilled at what you do. I always found that they were similar in that area. I oftentimes like would train in one day and play golf in the other day. Um, I just couldn't get over the physical <laughs> associated with doing golden one day. So like more power to you. But yeah, oftentimes um, I, I think you have a very, very astute point. You're probably a very proficient mover in golf. And you imagine all the years of experience and training you've had in golf. And then now um, you're just getting your ass kicked. Oh yeah. And, and I even you're told, just getting your ass kicked. I even told the sensei, I'm like, um, I said, look, I, I go from this world that, that I, I can, I don't even have to think of the, re- and it's a reaction that I, and I can perform and get the result I want a lot of the time. I said, I come here and I, I have like, I, I don't know the, the, uh, how to read the other person. Cause I'm just a beginner. I mean, he, I mean, you know, jujitsu, it, it takes you a yeah. year or, or longer just to get your yellow belt. And I said, I, I don't have any ammunition, so to speak to, to when you when you do your grappling or you do your stand up or your, or your groundwork, I said I, I don't. There's that that was so frustrating to go from yeah. one in the day to anything I want, and then the other one, I have nothing. Yeah, if we were to go super nerdy motor skill uh, explanation for that, think about golf. The demands in golf are very very different from the environmental de- demands of jujitsu. So in golf. Everything that you need to build a shot or a plan for a shot is right there in front of you. Mm-hmm. Why? Because the green is not moving. The ground is not moving. It could be different, but you know what it's going to be when you hit the ball. The ball doesn't move, right? So nothing in your environment moves in the way that it affects the way that you move. It's all there. All the information is there, right? You have all right. the answers. But in jujitsu, it's completely different. Your opponent is moving in various ways. And so based on how your opponent is moving, even if you're applying just one technique, the technique is going to need to be modified based on how your opponent is moving. So there's like a, there, you, you need to create a little bit more abstraction from the jujitsu technique based on how people are moving. Whereas golf, nothing is changing from the moment of time, from the, from the moment in time, at least in a, in a way that it affects your movements in your environment from the time you start your backswing to the time that the ball connects with your, um, or meets your club face. Unlike jujitsu, right? Where your opponent is moving in Constantly a variety moving. of different ways. Was that, yeah. I think I saw on your Instagram or somewhere that your, your brain seeks inconsistent movement, but in golf, everyone seems to be working towards yeah. consistent movement. That's the crazy thing. Like if you look at, um, if you look at, our movement research, usually healthier populations, there's a certain amount of variability that healthy moving populations exhibit. And there's a reason for that, right? There's an injury survival reason for that, for, for us to be able to move variably. So we are variable movers. Um, but then you have, you know, golf technology is really, really good. I'm a huge proponent of it and I use it and I have all of it in my lab. Um, 
But if you're going like, if you're trying to get consistency to like the 0.01 degree or even the 0.1 degree, you may not have an understanding about how variable we may be. Right. Right. And chasing the. Is it even attainable with the human chasing cons Yeah. It's just becoming, it's just basically, I mean, it's all, all a play on words, right? You can't repeat a movement the same way. Like in golf, you're going to drive yourself mad by mm -hmm. thinking that. I mean, we can get to outcome numbers in the same way, but the movements might be a little bit different. So I can get my, maybe I can get um, my face orientation in a, in a similar way, but my movements are going to be subtly different. Yeah, it's called right? being Just human, because, isn't it? Yeah. And so <laughs> I think it's important to understand um, how inherently we're variable and then just have that in the back of your mind as you're training, like even at elite levels, right? Don't like you could be a top 50 tour player. If you're trying to chase this unattainable level of consistency where you're just not going to get there, right? It's expectations. And we've learned through advanced golf stats that expectations are really, really important when you play golf. Um, it's just the same thing for consistencies. And yeah, that post was just more about a demonstration of, Hey, let's try, let's, we're made to be we're made to be variable movers. So just knowing that there's some certain guidelines as you're approaching high end status or even whatever it may be, this golf performance uh, path of how we want to be able to view how we want to view things or how we want to view progress or just the word how we use the word consistency. Yeah. So don't try to be a perfectionist as golfers are notorious for trying to do. Right. Yeah. And I think that's a that's a better word is don't try to be a perfectionist just become more consistent <laughs> yes. just become more consistent improve the best you can and be consistent and let the perfect days fall where they may yeah everybody's going to have a dispersion at an outcome level or at a movement level it's just have you done your best to tighten that what that dispersion is cool but let me i know, I know you got just a short amount of time and i always want to get the rapid fire emergency nine in so if you got just a few minutes we can run through those and all right let's go for it all right so the first one i the first and the last question i ask everybody because they're kind of cool and and it was if you were on the the Ryder cup you're walking up to the first tee what is your walk-up song oh my gosh it's probably going to be something from rage against the machine <laughs> that would get everybody going yeah all right um tour pro who swing you'd most like to have Oh, I love watching Adam Scott swing, but I love the outcome and look of Rory McIlroy. Yeah, that's pretty cool. You, you, there's a lot of players that you can't go wrong in any of them. Yeah, but both of those are like, those are the two. I love to watch those two swings. All right. Uh, favorite line from Caddyshack? Um, Noonan. Well, actually, no, no, no. <laughs> Noonan is 1B. The scream right before uh, in the downswing is the best line for me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, best James Bond. Which uh, actor the played current, the best James Bond? The current one. Uh, Daniel Craig. Yeah, Daniel Craig. Okay. And it's probably because it's like they're a little bit darker. I like, I don't like the comedic kind of Disneyland James Bondy. I mm -hmm. like the darker, grittier movies. All right. Or James Bond movies. Or um, even Batman. Do you look forward more to the Masters or the Ryder Cup? Oh, my gosh. I got to come up with some ones that stump everybody, even though it's rapid fire. Jeez. I got to them, make them think Sorry. a little bit. I have to choose one. I'm going to choose Ryder Cup. Okay. It, most, I mean, I ask these, and there is no right or wrong answer. It's yeah, it's not the right. If the, if the answer for me is both, but it, you know, I guess I'll have today. It's Ryder Cup. Tomorrow might be Masters. Okay, fair enough. Um, if you had an eight foot putt, mm -hmm. and if you make it, you get a million dollars cash. But if you miss it, you yeah. can't use your phone for a year. Do you take the putt? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> for sure. Uh, let's see. I think there are health benefits to not using your phone for a year. Oh, I could agree. I wish I could put mine. <laughs> I, I need to learn to put it down more. Talking about skill, I lack <laughs> significantly in that one. Um, if you could play around with any celebrity, who would it be? Oh, man. 
dead or alive? Anyone you want to. Dead or alive? Yep. Jesus Christ, a celebrity? I, I, I would have to classify that, yes. It is. Known around would, the world throughout history? I would say yes. I would do that because I think you can get a, a lot of answers, either whether you're a, a person of faith or not a person of faith. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. That, that's a very cool answer, by the way. Um, um, would you rather speak all languages or to all animals? Oh, all animals. That one's, yeah. Me too. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big dog guy. I got two dogs myself. I, yeah, I, I have a hundred pound Bernadoodle. <laughs> That'll keep you busy. And, years old. and the last one, uh, in your opinion, as far as the golf world is concerned, who's the greatest of all time? Who's the goat? Because uh, it's my generation. I'm saying Tiger Woods. Yeah, it, it's it, it, it has been a generational answer. Yeah. Of the age of the guest, I could classify, but based off somebody's age that comes on, I could tell you, or can I have a column of who said what, and it's pure generational. Yeah. I mean, even that, I'm not super happy with the answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I put it in but there. Got, it makes people well, think like, I gotta it. go. Like, I, get, I gotta go. That's, that's what I'm gonna go with. No but problem. But that's not gonna change on a daily basis like the Ryder Cup and the Masters. Cool. Um, what do you, anything coming up, lectures or online classes you're doing? People can check you out, follow you, do all that stuff. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Yeah. So I have, um, so John Dunnan again, and I have another semester one of Skilled Coaching Alliance. You can go to www.skilledcoachingalliance.com for semester one. That's our intro level course for any golf instructor. Even if you're a player, you'll get a lot out of it. Um, if you want to learn how to infuse motor control and learning into golf. And then, um, we have a semester two, which is super excited. We're super excited about that's our in-person one. That's a higher level um, where you get hands-on, more advanced concepts. But that's just for people who have completed or are in um, semester one. Um, and that, that's uh, www.skillscoachingonline.com? Uh, skilledcoachingalliance.com. Let me write down because I'll put the link in the, in the oh, show sweet. notes. Skilledcoachingalliance.com. Alliance. Yeah. .com. Yeah. For everybody listening, uh, just go to the website. I'll have the li direct link to that. I'll have the link to yeah. all your social media stuff. People can follow you. Uh, Sweet. And anything then, else you got coming up? Yeah, I have a couple talks at some PGA sectionals. I think there's uh, one in the Northeast. So if you're in there, I'll be doing um, a talk with uh, John Dunnigan. Um, and then um, there may be some golf articles coming out with some pretty good coaches um for the hard copy or online stuff with um some cool things for you all to read cool i look forward to yeah. it everybody check out dr will Wu. I'll, again all the links will be in the description show notes doctor yeah. we got to do it again oh yeah. no, for sure and if anybody wants to follow me on social media you can probably best is my instagram which is just uh dr will Wu. Okay, and that'll be in there. It'll be one yeah. click away, and they can start. Sweet. You'll be inundated with followers after this. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> awesome. All thank, right. Thank you for the time. You have a great night. Uh, it was my pleasure. You too, Pete. See ya. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed it, you can find more information on today's episode and other topics at golf360.blog. There you'll find the show notes and links, links related to this episode as well as any other episode that we've done so far to date. If you're interested in improving your game and would like to learn more from yours truly by taking a private lesson, a half-day or multi-day school, club or putter fitting, you can reach me through the blog site or by email pete at golf360.blog. So some of you may be asking, what is the golf paradigm? All you have to do is click on the homepage while on my blog site to discover how you can start playing better than you ever thought possible. Or you can simply sign up again on the blog page for my instructional videos where I give regular tips on all areas of the game to include the swing, club design and fitting, health, fitness and nutrition, the mental aspects, and equally as important, the integration of all those things together. I'm also on social media and you can find me at the Golf Paradigm, that's P-A-R-A, D I G M and I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel 
also under the same name, The Golf Paradigm. Facebook is usually the best way to reach me for questions and or comments, and I look forward to hearing what all of you have to say. This podcast is brought to you in part by Old South Golf Links. A short ride across a bridge from Hilton Head Island is one of the area's finest golf courses and a hidden treasure. Set up on towering pines and ancient oaks with sweeping march vistas, truly makes Old South Golf Links a one-of-a-kind golfing experience. The Clyde Johnson design was named one of the top 10 new public courses when it opened, and it also takes full advantage of the natural beauty of the low country. Old South is a fun and unique challenge for golfers of every skill level and a favorite of both locals and visitors. Whether it's your first time here or you're a regular, you'll be treated and feel like family. From the bag drop to check-in at the fully stocked pro shop with both men's and women's apparel, to breakfast or lunch before or after your round, the staff is always ready and willing to help. Experience for yourself why Old South is one of the premier golf courses in the Hilton Head area and why it will quickly become a favorite of yours too. Visit them in person or online at www.oldsouthgolf.com or to make it tea time, simply call the pro shop at 843-785-5353.